start sir uh okay uh good evening everyone i am dr samir patel practicing gastroenterologist at uh, noble institute of gastroenterology ahmedabad uh, actually i am sorry uh, because uh, dr yogesh harwani currently cannot join that's why i had to start the session uh, uh, so today is a 20th uh, clinic of our uh, uh, this uh, series of lectures and uh, today's topic we have is a uh, endoscopic ultrasound uh, guided pancreatic bulge of necrosis drainage as well as necrosectomy and with us today uh, we have dr sandeep laktakya i think uh, he doesn't need any introduction uh, but sir he is a uh, senior faculty at the uh, asian institute of gastroenterology and he is a head of uh, endoscopic ultrasound duty and uh, with us uh, we have a chairperson dr viral sha sir is a uh, senior consultant surgeon practicing in ahmedabad as well as for uh, 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 as a moderator to talk we have dr kunal bharadwaj uh, he is a consultant gastroenterologist practicing in uh, ahmedabad at gastro plus unit now uh, uh, i will give the speaker to uh, Dr. Kunal Bardwaj to start the session and to moderate the session. Okay. Thank you, Samir. Uh, I think Samir has made my job easy. He is already uh, he has already introduced uh, the clinic topic as well as the speakers. I think uh, uh, I will be delighted to moderate this session by my my teacher and my mentor, Dr. Sandeep Lakhtakia. Sir, please start the uh, presentation. Uh, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Kunal. Thank you, Samir, and thank you, Viral. Uh, COVID has made us uh, do a lot of webinars, and there's a spate and there's a increasing fatigue developing in people, both speakers as well as uh, uh, the audience. Audience. Oh, I'm not sure how many people would be joining today, but since we had promised, I think we will continue the promise. Uh, i'm sure viral is laughing and i'm sure he must be agreeing to what i am saying <laughs> yes sir yes, i really don't know how many sir? people have uh, hooked on today people yeah. eager to meet physically in the presence <laughs> <laughs> and uh, most of the talks nowadays uh, same talks are being repeated uh, or circulated by different speakers or same speakers in different forums but nevertheless i think we will do the formality since we have uh, already committed Uh, whosoever joins is fine, and uh, we can take the question answers as we progress further. So, you can see the slides there, Kunal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We so can I'm see. I'm speaking as suggested on EOS guided drainage of a wall of necrosis and a necrosectomy as a completion of the entire thing. So, in this uh, set of lecture. i would be covering these two aspects mainly drainage of the pancreatic collection uh, by a plastic or a metal stent and follow up of endoscopic necrosectomy if required in some so coming to the first part first before we do the drainage all the patients would have some imaging with them which can be in the form of mri or ultrasound or a good ct which tells us that the fluid collection is mature after the onset of acute pancreatitis and unless it is mature i think it's not wise to consider them for drainage because risk of leakage and perforation are much higher if they're not mature and as you can see on the image this looks a very nice uh, juicy very well defined collection with very minimal debris which is black in color this one has a little more debris in it and uh, ct scan also is done by many uh, it can show the maturity but the amount of debris is not so easy so if same patient if you have a ct as well as an eus and eus can tell you more accurately the debris and then you try to correlate if you see carefully after the ct has been done earlier which we ignored that but later we found the debris is still there so these are several ways of uh, defining the fluid collection and seeing the maturity having said that there is a clear cut differentiation now with atlanta classification the modified one which says that the wall of necrosis and pseudocyst are two different things they can be evolution of uh, uh, worn into pseudocyst or de decrease in amount of debris 
and they're basically defined by the presence of debris. If the collection is pure liquid, it's called pseudocyst, as you can see this one on the left, and this one, which is also right on the right panel. And uh, I'll try to skip the video then. Go to another thing that you can see and collect on uh, imaging is whether they are one or more, or if it looks to be two on uh, imaging, are they communicating at some point of time in, in some place? If they're communicating, then draining one is generally good enough and not trying to drain both. Plus, you know, any, any extension in mediastinal or deeper inside the mesentery or peritoneum is seen or not. Then, vault of necrosis is a fluid, as you can see on the right panel, which is black in color, along with this irregular whitish area, which is debris. So, whenever this whitish area is seen, it's called debris. And any amount of debris will now make this fluid called fluid, pancreatic fluid collection being called as a vault of necrosis. Plus, EOS gives an addition of looking at the interposing vessels apart from what's inside the content, and these interposing vessels can then be avoided at the time of drainage. So coming to indications of drainage as standard, whichever way we drain, by surgery, by percutaneous or by endoscopic means, in endoscopy it can be EOS or transmural by duodenoscope, which was being done about 15-20 years back, but now EOS has kind of taken over all this spectrum. Whichever collections are there and they're close to the GI tract, that is, they're close to stomach or esophagus or duodenum, can be drained through the EOS. But those collections which are far away, and paracolic gutters, then we have to use an alternate option of drainage, which is could be percutaneous or surgery, depending on the seriousness or sickness of the patient and the accessibility. So these are the standard indications of drainage of any collection, whichever way we want, following an acute pancreatitis, that is, infection within the collection and the patient has pain and fever or just pain itself and if the collection is big and causing any outlet obstruction to the bile duct or the stomach or even the esophagus plus uh, failure to thrive some patients just do not improve when the collection is there and uh, anything of uh, these symptoms are there then we consider them for drainage and i told you earlier we can consider them for either of three methods but endoscopy is generally preferred and transmural drainage is considered when it is a bulging cyst uh, or there were no vessel on CT scan and the wall thickness on the CT scan was less than centimeter. Endoscopy, I mean, is by conventional duodenoscope or a forwarding endoscope, which was being done earlier. And there are now several randomized control trials which have said that EOS is a better way of draining than the endoscopy drainage. The advantage of EOS is not only you can drain all these collections, but although also the ones which are not bulging in the GI lumen. And even if there are many vessels in the wall, you can find that small window of opportunity where there are no vessels and then you can reach that area. Having said that, transpapillary drainage of collections is rarely done in the setting of acute pancreatitis. It's mainly in the setting of chronic pancreatitis with uh, uh, side branch rupture and a main dark branch rupture, which has led to pseudocyst formation. And if these pseudocysts are small in size, then you can do transpapillary damage. So our main aim of uh, drainage today in a setting of acute pancreatitis is transmural by EUS uh, is the way to go forward. I'll skip this. So what's the advantage of EUS guided? drainage is that it improves the localization of the collection. That means that you can see the entire extent and where exactly is the point where I would like to enter. So you can visualize the collection and avoid any interposing vessels, as I said earlier, and select the thinnest point of entry. That makes the job a little easier, provided the scope is not in a very uh, oblique uh, fashion. It's a straight scope and the thinnest point of entry is the best way to go inside. Plus, we should know that the collection that we are draining is actually from the stomach and not the esophagus. Because then our, our, we have to fine-tune our further procedure. If you do not realize that you have punctured through the esophagus, which can sometimes happen in a, in a higher-up collection which are near to the cardia, then your instrumentation has to be uh, uh, adjusted in such a way that you don't cause any mediastinal perforation or complications. The drawback of uh, US uh, guided drainage is only that if you want to place a thick stents that is about 10 French or so through the accessory channel which is 3.7 compared to a duodenoscope which is 4.2 then these 10 French stents go very snugly especially if the scope is in a long position. 
So let's go to the steps. So this will be a little bit of technical talk as well so that people would be interested and they can fine tune their skills uh, if need arises. So the first step first is when you see any collection which is mature on conventional imaging, then you do an EUS and you reconfirm those findings. So here we can see a very nice mature collection. This is a debris inside and rest of the thing is entirely fluid. So in this static image, I can say that if I make it into half, so this is less than half, almost 25% and this frame looks to be debris. But this is a very dynamic thing. If you go from one corner of the cyst to the other corner of the collection, then it could actually be maybe about 10% or so because it may not be on the other side. So first thing is interrogation and then you puncture it. I'm sorry why the video is not playing. Okay. Anyway, this is okay. And once you puncture inside, then the you pass a guide wire after aspirating the fluid for analysis. And these are the several needles which are available for puncturing. Alternately, some people have also used a cystotome directly for puncturing or a needle knife. Needle knife is a very dangerous instrument because it's very flexible and it doesn't go exactly in the same direction where you want it to be and it can dissect the wall and cause perforation. The first one is preferred by Europeans where they use this flexible cystotome six and a 10 French combination where they first puncture with a six French without a guide wire and then remove the six French uh, inner uh, cystotome and then pass a guide wire and then over that they pass a 10 French cystotome. Whichever way we enter, we re first remove the stylet and aspirate the fluid and send for analysis. So these are the pros and cons of different instruments that we use. A 19 gauge needle that is uh, preferred by most is very visible, good transfer of force from the handle to the tip. The difficulty is sometimes you have the tangential puncture, especially in a, in a long uh, scope position. And sometimes the wires can get sheared, but that's more in the pseudocyst, uh, not that's mainly in the biliary drainage than in other things. Cystotome, it's, uh, a cautery is used for penetration. It's flexible, adjustable. You can adjust the angle, but the visibility is not so good. And sometimes direction can change and that can cause problems. Having passed the access, the, the collection, then you pass the guide wire and the preferred guide wire is a long wire should be used, not the short wire system. So it should be at least 450 centimeters, uh, the standard wires which are used. And my personal preference is to use a one which has an angle tip. The reason being that if the cyst is not mature, we are not able to interrogate entirely, then a straight wire can sometimes go bang on and hit the opposite wall and go into the peritoneum. So in a mature cyst, either of the wire is good, but in a doubtfully mature cyst, use an angled wire, which will not hit with a great pressure on the opposite wall and it will bounce off. Once you're inside the cyst, you make several coils. In a big collection, one coil is good enough, which goes the entire circumference of the collection. And in a smaller cyst, you can have two or three coils. And once you've made enough coils, then you withdraw the needle. And the next step now is that over this wire, we create a fistula between the, if the entry point is stomach, then it's a cystogastric fistula or any other part of the GI tract that the cystoenteric fistula, it can be esophagus, it can be stomach, it can be duodenum. And it can be either mechanically dilated or electrosurgically dilated. Mechanical, as the name suggests, you pass either of these instruments. It can be a dilator or a small tapered stiff balloon or a, or a bougie or a cannula, tapered cannula. Electrosurgical instruments are very commonly used and six fences to tome is a standard that we use very often in our unit. Needle knife can also be used, but again, the same risk happens here too, that it goes tangential to the direction of wire and it cause dissection. So in mechanical, it can be bougie or a balloon. Those ha each have their own pluses and minuses and, and electrosurgical devices can be cystotome or needle knife. Cystotome is the best preferred device by most expert interventional endoscopist. So let's see how it is done. Oh, oh, I don't know why it's happening. Maybe there are too many videos and the videos. So are maybe, uh, so sorry to interrupt. You can go in the folder and then maybe. Yeah, you just give me a minute. Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Sure. Okay, just give me a minute here. Something which happened. 
I'm glad Yogesh joined back. I'll just go out of the, the Zoom and come back in a minute. Something which happened. Yogesh, can you see me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, can see you, sir. Yes, sir. See you. I, I Good evening, Dr. Viral, Dr. Kunal, and Dr. Sami. Good evening. Welcome, Yogesh. Good evening, Yogesh. So to all audience, good evening, sir. So to all audiences, uh, please bear a moment. There is some technical error with the video. We'll join back soon. So please be online. It may take two to three minutes. So good night to uh, discuss something till sir is back. Uh, in your unit, what are the indications for drainage of a pseudocyst or a world of pancreatic necrosis? Uh, you wish, uh, the absolute indication if we see then uh, infected WON that is the uh, absolute indication for EUS guided drain EUS or uh, any drainage of the uh, world of necrosis uh, then other indications are if they are symptomatically which cannot be managed uh, with medication like if there is an intractable pain uh, with uh, because of the increase in the cyst size or there is uh, or any other cause because there is a hemorrhage or all the, then you can do the drainage if they are causing the obstructive symptoms like if there is a head or body pancreatic uh, WN which is compressing on the stomach or duodenum and causing gastric outlet obstruction or if there is a biliary obstruction then this should be drained. Uh, what do you recommend earlier? There were uh, criteria that more than six centimeters, more than six weeks. Do you still follow that criteria? No, 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 no. Anyhow, no, no. important in today's date? Uh, usually what happens, uh, more than six centimeter, uh, if that persists after six weeks, uh, uh, the conventional guidelines say they are very rarely to uh, resolve. But the latest guideline, all they say, okay, if, if it is, even if it is more than six weeks, they can usually resolve if there is no uh, any other complication like uh, infection or if there is no debris, uh, if, if it is not WON, then usually pseudosis they resolve. Uh, very rarely in case of acute pancreatitis that uh, pseudosis uh, persist. The WN can persist for long, but pseudosis they usually resolve in case of acute pancreatitis. In case of chronic pancreatitis, it is very difficult that they resolve because most of the time it is a pancreatic ductal uh, leakage uh, and uh, they are rarely resolved uh, in case of CP. Uh, I think Dr. Viral. So you are mute, sir. You are mute. Yes, Kuna. Viral sir, uh, just want to ask question that now endoscopics are uh, taking everything from surgeon. Do, yes. do you think still there are some morphology that can still be better tackled with uh, surgery rather than uh, this EUS so, or any other endoscopic? Uh, particularly in pseudocyst, I say when there is a lot of necrosis is there with the slough and everything, uh, stent, endoscopic EUS guided stenting, and drainage may sometimes uh, you know, you encounter the obstruction of the stands with the tissues and necrosis. In that case, uh, surgery may give you better results. Uh, where, whenever there is fluid is very clear, little bit of necrosis, preferred approach is EUS guided. But when there is a lot of necrosis and a patient is not good, fever, persistent fever and all that, clinically not good, Straight away going for a surgery and a definitive treatment may help uh, the patient earlier. I feel it more more depends on the amount of necrosis because if yeah. the amount of necrosis is more, 
then endoscopically things can be performed but it will need a uh, recurrent endoscopic interventions at weeks and yeah. in our country it may not be feasible uh, to do it every 10 days because many patients are from periphery affordability is an issue so uh, what we follow is if more than 50% necrosis directly goes to a surgeon if less than 50% we can go ahead with endoscopic necrosis i think yeah. sir has joined yes okay welcome sir do you see my screen now okay can you see my screen yes sir yes sir okay. we can i am sorry i apologize this actually this folder is so heavy and all these files are not in one folder they are in different parts of the computer so i had to switch off and switch on and that took some time so this is the first step of puncturing the the collection as you can see it here you can see the needle all the way and then you pass the guide wire inside and then these are steps that i covered earlier and moving forward so this is the next step of once you have a guide wire secured inside one or two loops on the fluoroscopy then you do a create a fistula which can be a mechanical with a bougie cannula or any other stiff instruments and once you create this fistula then you can, other instruments can then pass much easily but most people don't prefer this mechanical and cystotome is the most preferred device as i said earlier which literally burns and in, in a few seconds you're inside the collection and once you have created the fistula then you dilate with a balloon and uh, i'll go back to the previous slide again because that's an important slide i'll share again and then you dilate with a balloon which can be 10 to 15 mm from the stomach or if you have gone through the esophagus then about 4 to 6 mm is safe and from the duodenum 6 to 8 mm so that's a dictum and having dilated now then you can pass a second guide wire inside if you plan to place two or three plastic stents and now i'll go back to the previous slide and how do you place multiple guide wires and there are several devices there are cannulas which have multiple channels two or three wires can go inside to different channels or this is a double cannula wire a uh, loop wire which is now withdrawn from by cook is another interesting wire it if you have passed the first wire straight then you can pass this second wire over the first wire and this can be uh, easily done without any extra cannula with multiple holes so if you have entered from the stomach 10 to 15 mm esophagus 4 to 6 and duodenum 6 to 8 and if your intent is to place metal stent which i'll cover later then a small caliber balloon of 4 to 6 mm is good enough so this is a small caliber balloon for placing a metal stent but a larger stent uh, larger caliber is used if you want to place a plastic stent so what is the size we generally prefer is a, if the pseudo cyst is only there and not a wan then and it's sterile then 10 to 12 mm from the stomach is good enough but if it's infected then you go a little big allow the infected material to come out in the stomach provided the stomach the point of entry but esophagus and duodenum don't overshoot the dedicate the intended size if it's a world of necrosis whether it's sterile or infected then at least 5 mill 15 mm should be done because then you sometimes have to do necrosectomy at the later date and then the final step of placing the stent so you have first puncture first step and pass the guide wire second step is creating a fistula third step is dilating the tract with a balloon and the last step is placing the uh, stent and plastic stents which we generally place for pseudo cysts or one with very less debris then always place both the plastic stent both the guide wires before and then place one by one never try to place one stent over first wire and then to try to cannulate in that hole because then you can dissect and cause more complication and the procedure gets prolonged the longer the procedure more chances of complication so never never try to skip a step so that you can do it later always follow the same steps this is an important slide i thought i will share with all of you is which are the we see differently by us we can see endoscopically we can see fluoroscopically and by us image so all three images are available to us if you are doing under fluoroscopy so inspection is done by us puncture is done purely by us you don't require endoscopy and fluoroscopy guide wire you can easily see under us 
but fluoroscopy is needed to confirm whether it's is kind of circum uh, circled inside nicely along the circumference of the cyst you don't require endoscopic view at that time creating a fistula again eus is alone good enough but you can require fist, uh, fluoroscopy to check whether you have crossed it or not but sometimes the feel itself is good enough and you will know that then next step of balloon dilatation again with eus you would know but fluoroscopy and endoscopy sometimes required to reposition the the balloon so that it's not entirely inside the collection so half is inside the collection half is in the gi lumen and then it bridges well over it so that it doesn't move around and then lastly placing the stent again we use eus as a first part but more often we use fluoroscopy and endoscopy to see the exact placement of the correct positioning of the stent moving forward the next step is most patients now recover after placing the stents at least 3 out of 4 would recover but 1 out of 4 that is 25% may have some symptoms which have not resolved or new symptoms may come up and that's where the role of endoscopic uh, necrosectomy starts so what does necrosectomy means that you take a forward wing endoscope go through the hole which you have created now after further dilatation and then go inside the cavity and now clean it up and there are several instruments that can be used which can be snare basket roth basket tripod bipod pentapod so all those things are there by which you can catch these uh, loose debris and try to take them out one by one this is a very labor intensive procedure so if you have place up front plastic stent uh, then it is not done at the same setting of the first drainage of placing plastic stents symptoms are observed and Three or four days later, after the index drainage, if the symptoms are persisting or have come up now, then you do this. So the trap now collapses a little bit. So you have to dilate again with fifteen millimeter balloon at least, and take your scope inside beside the plastics and don't take them out because that's your kind of lifeline by which you can enter beside it, and then keep doing it. So algorithm is that you place first seven French stents. You can use a nasocystic tube also for irrigation purpose. second session you after deep brightment you place uh, again stent extra if you want or place a necessary tube for irrigation external irrigation so dilatation can be done up to 15 to 20 if aggressive uh, people are there but my personal preference is 15 or maximum 18 is what i have done i never do 20 you go inside inspect the cyst if you see granulation tissue and some loose uh, debris the loose debris can be entangled your your snare which is my preferred instrument for debridement and once you feel that the entire area is uh, having good healthy granulation tissue that is probably the end point sometimes you see debris is quite adherent to the back wall and you try to nibble it out with various instrument nothing comes out in that situation i would say not to do further just place a nasal stick and irrigate with 100 ml of saline 8 hourly for next 3 or 4 days most of this adherent debris becomes loose with passage of time if a person has infection and frank pus is there which is also the adherent debris then you can use hydrogen peroxide so these sessions are done two or three days apart each time you'll have to dilate with a balloon because the opening closes back and gradually you keep doing it on an average a patient which has significant debris takes three two to four sessions i would say and that's where the role of these metal stents come so if you have you have a collection which has significant debris what is significant is debatable uh, anything less than 10 i would say is treated like a pseudocyst but anything more than 30 is like significant so between 10 and 30 is a gray area which can do well with a plastic stent but may not do very well with a plastic also so that is the area where you have to take a call and that's where these stents come very handy these large carryable metal stents are dedicated and meant for this pancreatic fluid collection drainage and there are two categories lamps as we all know axios is a standard lamps they are lumen opposing whereas the nagi stent is not so lumen opposing it's called it's called biflange metal stent and that's a difference so they can migrate in and out if you try to do much too much of wriggling inside and the lumen of these stents are shorter or thinner so how do we place nagi stent so first step remains the same you puncture then you pass the guide wire second step also remains the same the third step of passing a cystotom remains the same the fourth step of dilating a balloon remains the same but only thing that use a smaller caliber balloon we don't use a large caliber because 
if you do a say 15 millimeter dilatation, the fluid will gush out. And then you, when you're passing a metal stent, the cavity is either getting emptied or almost nearly empty. So you want only a little bit of fluid to come out and your steps should move very fast. So then you follow with us, it's Nagi stent and place it under, uh, the inner part is placed under the US vision. Then you use a fluoroscopy for the inner part also. So inner end is endos US and fluoroscopy and gastric end is by endoscopy and fluoroscopy together. And this would be the perfect position that you would like to have uh, about a centimeter jutting out in the stomach. If you see this kind of a uniform waste, which is half this side and half this side, that's perfect. That means the marker in the center has the thinnest point, which you can also sometimes see on EUS, which is something like a bow tie that we wear. And most world of necrosis now actually improved just by placing this metal stand. And this we had published three years back no, actually four years, that our index drainage kind of patient got cured, 75% of the patient got cured. But those who did not improve, we went step by step to different levels. This is a step up approach where we placed, uh, do, did a cleaning of the stent, which was clogged by the debris that improved by about 5%. And if that did not help and the debris was adherent, then we placed a nasal tube and did irrigation that I further improved by another 8%. And finally, we did necrosectomy in a, in a smaller percentage of patients. So overall, about 10% required necrosectomy. And at each level, we got incremental success. So that's how we approached. The, the other stent which is there, which I call is hot axios, is selling like hotcakes nowadays. Expensive stent, but very efficient stent. With no time, you can drain the entire collection without fluoro as well. So it can be done as a bedside. You don't require fluoroscopy, just EUS and endoscopic vision, you can do the entire things. It has a little uh, steps marked on the disassembly, uh, which are a little complicated to understand first, but once you get used to it, then it becomes an intuitive way of delivering these stents. And these stents also expand with passage of time, or you can dilate at the time of placement. For Nagi also, we it expands in two or three days time, but we don't dilate because the risk of migration is very high. Whereas risk of migration with axios is much lesser and you can do it. Here you see this patient has a large amount of debris inside, almost nearing 50%. And these are the ones which may require necrosectomy. And that's why you need a more efficient stent, which is limon opposing, where you can do a necrosectomy if required later on. So once you start seeing the black marker in the stomach, then you release the other end. And you see the pus coming out. Hot Nagi is uh, trying to mimic what uh, Axios is doing. So it has a, a cautery enhanced tip, which can burn its way in just like Nagi. Uh, although the transmission of force is not as efficient as Axios, but if the wall is thin, then you can actually do it similar to what is done with an Nagi stent. And uh, uh, just like hot Nagi, hot Spaxis is also available, which is a lumen opposing stent. So if cost is a constraint, then these stents can be used, uh, either hot Spaxis or hot Nagi. But I believe a cold Nagi or a cold Spaxis does as good a job of five minutes extra if you spend and uh, if you can cut down the cost, which is a common concern in India, then it, it does a lot of good. But whichever stent we place, they're all very, very efficient. I said 75% of world of necrosis disappear just by placing any metallic stent. It's only one fourth required some kind of intervention later on. And this is how it looks like. And then you can pull out these stents by three to four weeks when the collection is gone. So further interventions, as I said earlier, required a step up approach. This is the stent which is clogged by the debris and you can very easily tease it out using uh, any instrument. And I said earlier, my preferred instrument is a snare, which can just catch it uh, gently and tease it out. Once you clean the, the cavity, you can clean the stent lumen, you can go inside and peep and see what is to be done further. If required, you can do it at the same sitting. If the debris is adherent, as I said earlier, 
or it is significant, then you place this nasocystic tube for external irrigation. And last step is to do necrosectomy through the Nagi stent uh, into the cavity. So this is frank first, patient is symptomatic, and then you can use an instrument either staying within the lumen of the stent or going inside totally and watching inside. It all depends on how capacious the cyst is because they rapidly depress, decrease in time. So advantage of these large caliber metal stents are very easy to deploy and high technical success is now with experience gaining uh, widely all over India. Uh, they are large diameter at least 16 to 20 millimeters uh, and so efficient drainage is possible and they're fully covered so prevent any leak and perforation which can occur with plastic stents. They're self-expandable so prevent any bleeding which can occur at the entry site. I will show some example later on. And the design is either by flange or saddle shape, which reduces the risk of migration. And re-intervention is also possible through these stents. So all these are major advantages, but there are some disadvantages also with all these stents. And what are those? Sometimes malpositions have occur, especially in the beginning of carrier. It has occurred with all of us. And uh, uh, these can be tied over, but uh, it is a challenge and unnecessary strain uh, to, the, to the society, to the system that you're following or that unit. Uh, bleeding from the vessels can occur later on. This has been reported both with uh, majority and with axios because it's a little firm stent. And as the cyst collapses, the back wall comes and rubs against it as, you, as the patient respires, and that can cause bleeding. Migrations also can occur spontaneously, uh, which can or it can add direct endoscopic necrosectomy. And sometimes they can be hindrance to direct to endoscopic necrosectomy also, because they have flanges inside and the debris can be on the sides of these flanges where your instruments cannot reach it. As it is, the cyst has collapsed from 10 centimeter to five centimeter. And in that, the, the debris is around the walls of the collection of the stent, then you cannot reach it easily. So you have to take it out and then do necrosectomy. So which stent to use? I tried to answer it earlier, I'll re-emphasize. So plastic stent is, is good or preferred for patients which have pure pseudocyst or which have very less debris. Anything less than 10%, I think plastic is as good as a metal stent. Above 30% metal is, is good. It is quite efficient and can drain off easily. The gray area is between 10 and 30% and which is still kind of, uh, a debated area. I'll show one more example of necrosectomy now, which through the, uh, this is now through the Nagi stent. Uh, earlier we did the declogging of the stent, but here we have a large necroma. And again, I use my preferred instrument of snare. You can catch it. And if you get a good grip on a large necroma, it can come out in one go through the stent. But often, if it's a big necroma, it carries a stent also along with it. So this was a very large chunk which came out in one go after a few attempts at catching it. It's almost as good as surgical necrostectomy. So you can be lucky. But having placed a metal stent, one must remember that that job is not done there. You have to tell the patient that this has to be removed. It's a foreign body. Unlike a plastic which can be left indefinitely, metals have to be removed because of the risk of complications. And generally by three to four weeks, we remove them off. Uh, we always prefer do an imaging before removal that is MRCP to look at the ductal anatomy and place a plastic stent if there's a disconnected duct or the patient has any residual collection left behind. So this is one of the internally migrated stent. All the cysts has resolved, but a patient came much later and you can peep from inside this uh, stent at the wall is quite healthy, but we don't want to leave it because there'll be deeper, there'll be blood vessels and this can cause future problems. This is still in time because you have an access to it, but gradually this gastric end of the stent keeps uh, closing down and sometimes it gets like a buried bumper. It can be totally uh, covered inside and may not be visible. And that then surgery may be required. So the complications of uh, drainage of one is that bleeding, perforation, infection, and air embolism. The last is almost gone now because everybody is using carbon dioxide. Infections, yes. Perforations have reduced drastically because it, these are fully covered uh, stents. 
So if you have a perforation which has occurred time of drainage, you switch from plastic to metal. If your initial intent was plastic, switch to metal and so goes for bleeding. So let me show you an example of a patient which was uh, with very minimal debris. We had a plan of placing a plastic stent, but while doing the procedure, we realized that it's torrentially bleeding. You can see it here and you put a Doppler, it kind of, it's an arterial bleed. It's bleeding with a pulse rate. So we switched from, we decided not to go ahead with plastic, but immediately switched to a Nagi stent. And this is what we are placing. And when they expands, it causes tamponade to the vessel which had ruptured. So you can see the blood in the lumen, but it stopped now. So we keep a plastic stent just for a prevention of any migration or occlusion by the debris inside. But the bleeding stopped, which was a major disaster which could have occurred in the same patient. Sometimes these stents can migrate inside as you see it here. And you can salvage it by if you have a opening visible or a plastic stent there, which can guide you and you can dilate this path with a balloon and then go inside the cavity using a forward wing endoscope. You see the pus coming out. You see the stent deep inside. But if you catch one of the edge of the stent and gently pull it out, it's a very soft stent. So if you feel Nagi and Axios, Nagi is a very soft stent. So it doesn't cause too much damage and you can reposition it back. So that's the beauty of it, which is unlike axios where repositioning is not very easy. So in the end, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, metal stents are good for world of necrosis with significant debris. Plastic stents are good for pseudocytes with minimal debris. Re-intervention is only done in patients who have symptoms which are either persisting or have new occurred, newly occurred, especially like persistent SIRS is going on. And re-intervention can be in various forms that like cleaning the stent lumen, doing a lavage or a den, or sometimes multi-gateway can be done. Or even percutaneous the extension more in a paracolic gutters, you can reach by percutaneous rules. But remember to remove these metal stents early after a finite indwell time of three to four weeks. With that, I would like to sum up here by saying thank you very much for your kind attention. Any questions or comments? I have. Yes, I guess, sir. sir. There will be a few questions, and so it was a very lucid presentation. Uh, <clears throat> so, sir, uh, when uh, we do a necrosectomy, sir, means in the second sitting, once we enter the cavity and remove chunks of debris, many mm -hmm. times we encounter bleed from the cyst wall. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, these bleeds are self-controlled, but occasionally they may bleed more, which may lead to panic at this time. So what, uh, what precautions can be taken and if such bleed occurs, what can be done to uh, stop this such kind of bleed? Mm. So that's a very valid point. So necrosectomy risk of, because the, the base is very raw. It's a healthy granulation tissue which is happening, but the vessels are round and you touch with a snare or any instrument bleed happens. It's generally a minor ooze, but sometimes you can see big vessels at the, in the, in the, through traversing the cyst, which is a splenic vessels, and they can bleed torrentially, either splenic vein or artery. So if you see any of those vessels, uh, I would suggest not to use your instruments very close to them, especially all these uh, forceps and snares can injure the vessel and that is, uh, so use a water jet and uh, kind of uh, do a blunt dissection with water jet. Do not be in a hurry to clean the entire cyst, you can come back another day because a lot of cleaning happens naturally. The human body is, is kind of a defense mechanism. The acid goes in and cleans it up. So give it that a time. Or if you feel the debris is too adherent, put a, leave a nasocystic tube and uh, keep irrigating. But if you see a vessel, don't use hydrogen peroxide. Just saline is good enough. Sir, do you, re, uh, do you recommend that PPIs or any anti-acid medications or H2 blockers should not be used when we place such stents? Yes, so we avoid using any PPIs unless it's recommended for some other reason in that patient because we want the acid to be there and we believe this acid trickles inside and does some cleaning. Sir, what is the amount of necrosis you decide that this should be handed over to a surgeon? Surgeon. <laughs> so, uh, 
if somebody has more than 50% debris to start off with, I would uh, have a meeting with a surgeon and the patient together. And we tell the pros and cons of both the procedures. So cost, surgery, hospital stay versus, uh, so if the patient is willing for a non-invasive, non-surgical method initially and willing to take a surgical option later, which can occur in say, I would say one out of four with a patient with significant debris. So I would uh, approach that way. But those who do not want a, a unclear path, I let them go to surgeons straight away who can do a better job than me. Sir, if uh, uh, like uh, if there is a site uh, the uh, WN is straightening towards the paracolic gutter, still we we go for US guided drainage or we should uh, send it to surgeons. That's a very good question, Kunal. I'm glad that you asked that. So there will be that we divide cyst by in three ways. Some are central collections which are very close to the stomach. Some are peripheral collections which are paracolic and have no they're not close to GI tract. And the third variety, so the and third variety is our large ones, which can be approached both percutaneously as well as by the, by the endosonographically. So the first one goes to endoscopist, the pure paracolic go to radiologist, and the one which have both like, from center to X to the periphery, we tackle them together. So we do a combined drainage, and that's a very important thing. What is combined drainage? Combined drainage is where radiologist will place a percutaneous catheter, but they will not, they will keep it locked. And the patient will then come from the radiology room directly to endosono room. So there has to be good communication and a frequency match so that it's done at the same time. Then we do an EOS guided drainage and let it drain. Now, once we have done, then we open the percutaneous drain open. So now we have the patient has two gateways of drainage. One is in the stomach and one is paracolic. The purpose of this is that it becomes more efficient and it prevents a future external pancreatic fistula. I'm sure all of you must have seen this that when you do percutaneous or a surgical drainage, they put a drain. Now the patient has become better, but he's hanging with a drain, which lasts for one month, two months, six months, or sometimes even a year or so which we don't want it. This has also been shown in the Lancet trial where the surgery versus endoscopic treatment. Went. This was a major difference between the surgical versus endoscopic drainage that we don't have an external pancreatic fistula. So if the endoscopist drains and leaves it and then it comes to us on second day, by the time the fluid is already gone and we cannot see then that collection. So this uh, uh, frequency or uh, uh, synchronization between the radiologist and the endoscopist should be good. Sir, you put NCT, that nasal cystic drainage tube, in all patients of W1 drainage? So, uh, another good question. So, we don't, if uh, there is frank pus and a lot of debris seen on US at the time of drainage, then I would place at the index drainage itself a metal stent and a nasal cystic tube. But if the patient has only debris and no fever, I will just leave like that a metal stent and the patient is always admitted. So we have a clinical follow-up on the patient. If he's doing well in three, four days time and a, and a CT screening shows that the collection is totally gone, then he goes home. But if he has symptoms that is not or has not improved or has worsened, then we do a, a quick CT screening followed by endoscopy. At this endoscopy, we'll often find the stent either clogged or blocked by the debris, which we will remove and then place a nasocystic also because there will be more debris inside the cavity, which we have now observed from the stomach going inside the cavity. And then we irrigate it. Sir, that uh, H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, everybody uses the different formulation of it. What is the AIG protocol? What you people are using? So the hydrogen peroxide is available as 3% hydrogen peroxide. It has to be freshly prepared. It comes in a brown bottle or a white bottle. So whenever we use it, the bottle should be sealed. If somebody has left it open, because it comes in a 100 ml container. If somebody leaves it open, it becomes water. That's useless. So it has to be a fresh bottle and you inject about, about 10 to 20 cc of uh, hydrogen peroxide inside the cavity through the nasocystic tube. You're talking about the nasocystic irrigation, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, 
Hydrogen peroxide works by releasing the oxygen free radicals, which are released in the initial five or 10 minutes only. After that, it becomes water. So in the ward, the patient has an elastic tube inside. We open a freshly prepared bottle, which a fresh bottle of hydrogen peroxide, loaded with in the syringe of 20 cc, and inject through the NCT and leave it for 10 to 15 minutes. Don't mix with saline, don't mix with water, just leave it like that. After 15 minutes, when it had in this oxygen free radical job is over, then you connect with 100 ml of saline bottle and let it go uh, uh, in, a, in a flushed manner or a fast manner. It should not be other way around. It should not be hydrogen peroxide after saline because then it gets diluted there. Okay. The uh -huh. only caveat is that some people, some patients get a lot of pain while hydrogen peroxide is given. Yes, if sir. that happens, I don't use it because I, if that tells us that there is some leakage in the, in the wall of the collection, which is going to the peritoneum and some peritoneum happens. So if the patient says I get pain, I will only use saline as my irrigation fluid and not hydrogen peroxide. Many patients do complain of vomiting, sir, after uh, injecting hydrogen peroxide. That's right. That's another symptom. Correct. You're right. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Viral and Dr. Samir, uh, there are a few questions in the chat box. I think you can ask uh, relevant questions uh, uh, which are relevant for today's topic. Uh, uh, actually, I want to ask one question, sir. How do you manage enteral nutrition in the query procedural period? And another thing, after uh, uh, once the collection has resolved and we remove enteral uh, whatever stems or whatever we have put, after that, when, uh, when you will start the patient orally? Good question again. So most patients start feeling better once you have drained them. If the indication is good, just the mere presence of collection is not the indication. They should have symptoms. So those symptoms would start improving and they will start eating. But if they're not eating still because of either continuing infection or new infection, which has come into a sterile one, then we prefer to place a nasogeginal tube because uh, uh, that would help in uh, giving more gut nutrition, which is prevents the sepsis, improves the uh, overall uh, <laughs> situation. We, don't try to use a nasogastric tube because this feed will now go inside the, the cavity. So that's the reason of using a nasogeginal tube for the feeding purpose. So sir, do you recommend so, in all, all WOPN we should put a nasogeginal tube? Not all. So those who are have a good albumin and are eating well, they don't require it. Those who have a poor albumin, then we place them at the same index procedure itself because we anticipate that they will not be eating and they will not recover faster. So that same, so we avoid one extra endoscopy procedure. Same time, once you have trained, you place a wire guide down, down and uh, place a nasogeginal tube with the same sitting. So in one of your uh, slides, you showed that when we puncture through the esophagus, <clears throat> so uh, should we place stent or we should leave it? Metal stent is out of question, no, sir, yeah. to, from this, yeah. But plastic stents we can place or not? We can place plastic stents. So uh, a trick over here is never be in a hurry to drain. You spend at least five to 10 minutes before drainage. And this time should be spent not only in interrogating the cyst, you should also look at which is the right position for me to puncture, enter the cyst. And uh, if so you look at the G junction through the EOS scope and endoscopic view, you know where the G junction is located. And keep it in mind, you can spell it out that 40 centimeters G junction. Now, if you forget also, at least your assistant would remember that you have told that 40 centimeter. And then your needle has to be at least 40 centimeter beyond. Your puncture point should be beyond that. Otherwise, if you have accidentally pulled back and punctured, then you cannot do entire thing. And those collections which have both access from the stomach as well as esophagus, it is better to drain from the stomach side because the gravity helps in draining and that's a much safer way to drain. But if no other way is available and esophagus is the only way, then uh, use a small caliber balloon and place a plastic stent. Dr. Viral, uh, can you please ask a few questions from the chat box? Yeah. Uh, sir, one of the uh, person has asked, how will you treat this percutaneous fistula? Is there any role of endoscopic drainage after percutaneous uh, fistula? 
yeah those are very difficult ball games yeah. um, the longer it, it is uh, between the index drainage and the patient coming back with a fistula the more likelihood that that patient has got a disconnected pancreatic tract that means the head and the tail of the pancreas are not disconnected it's a viable pancreas secreting all the pancreatic juice and sugar and insulin but it's not able to drain it out and it's coming percutaneously so there are few ways to tackle it endoscopically which may or may not succeed the conventional uh, teaching is that you do surgery and you remove that part of pancreas but we need to salvage it we need to use that pancreas for both digestion as well as prevention of diabetes so one of the ways that we follow is that uh, do an eus first is uh, get an mrcp and show how much is the gap between the head and the tail part if the gap is very short then we should try to bridge first by the ercp route if we are able to cross that uh, disconnected segment which looks disconnected on mrcp but this is a not a dynamic investigation secret and mrcp is a more dynamic investigation but unfortunately it's not available so ercp is the next best way so gently if we inject contrast and are able to fill upstream towards the tail side then we should try to bridge the two by transpapillary stenting but frankly speaking this process works in about 10% or so 90% it doesn't work because now that part has gone it's atrophied central part and upstream is separate so in this situation now you either block the percutaneous tube depending on how much uh, uh, drain output is coming say somebody is draining 100 ml per day and the mileage of that fluid is say 10000 or 1 lakh which confirms that it is a pure pancreatic juice once you block it this fluid will start accumulating inside it may not form a pseudo cyst purely but it may cause some kind of a fuzzy collection and this should be done as an inpatient so do an ultrasound percutaneously if you find a small collection if you are able to see it do an eus and drain and make a, a plastic stent and play, leave it permanently then you can safely ex- remove this would work in one out of four so 10% and one out of four so now you are left with uh, about 65% mm-hmm. patients now which is again a difficult job so now you see if the pd is still dilated and a long segment of the pd upstream is dilated then you can use an eus guided drainage where you can puncture either uh, from the disconnected upstream or from the tail side whichever is more easily accessible from the eus and try to place a plastic stent which will again succeed in uh, one out of four so we can do a good job but it is a, a no, not very full proof method so there is one of the question should we lavage wopn with antibiotics i think earlier there were few papers which uh, used to uh, advise injection of omega yeah, no gentam gentam i'm sure all of you agree with it it doesn't work because systemic antibiotics are better and uh, installation of uh, gentamicin or something inside doesn't really work S- sir is there any uh, role of uh, ercp with pd stenting like what we do in cp with pseudocyst like in w and almost two third of the patient are having a disconnected duct so is there any uh, role of uh, planning ercp plus pd string at the same uh, uh, sitting same, same session of drainage yes That's sir too early uh, kunal when we drain uh, the entire collection doesn't uh, come out or entire fluid doesn't come out it's in a high pressure area but once you put a stent it will decompress to some level and then rest of the part actually happens very slowly over a period of few days or few weeks time so doing an ercp at that time may not be very useful you can in fact cause infection which was not there to start off with so, uh, that uh, philosophy i don't uh, although there are publications of that in gi endoscopy many years ago but i don't uh, agree to that way of handling but we should do an ercp very early after the complete resolution of cyst so if you have drained today two weeks later if you see that the cyst is totally gone at that time get an mrcp and at the time of stent removal metal stent if you have placed at the time of stent removal do a pd gram do a ercp but this should not be very aggressive uh, pancreatogram 
So this is our observation that if you do early ERCP, say two weeks later, sometimes that disconnection is not permanent. It's still a leak, but not scarred enough. And that is the crucial window of opportunity where we can do a transpapillary bridging. So, uh, Dr. Viral, would you like to uh, ask anything further to Sir, Dr. Samit? So, with everybody's permission, can we give a vote of thanks, all faculties? Yes, sir. Yes. So, Sir, thank you so much, Dr. Sandeep. And on befolded hands, I oh. thank you from uh, Ahmedabad Physician Association and Noble Gastro Hospital that you accepted our invitation. And this was for the first time we hear you always in conferences, but this was an honor for physicians and surgeons of Gujarat that they could listen to you today. And thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And thank I apologize, you. I'm late slightly. No, 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 no. Thank, you. thank you, Yogesh. Thank you, Viral, Kunal, and Samir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night.